Welcome to the Rock the Stage Show. Each week, international media expert Rich Bontrager has in-depth and personal conversations with celebrities, top leaders, authors, speakers, and media professionals. Now, from the Rock the Stage studios, here's your host, the Trigger, Rich Bontrager. Welcome back. It's Sunday night, 7 o'clock, and we're here once again for Rock the Stage Show every Sunday night. Well, most every Sunday night, we're here once again with a brand new show. And again, we are proud to be going globally. 17 different countries now for Rock the Stage are tuned in on most Sunday night with us or throughout the week. And we're on the YouTube channel, of course. You can add your comments, join us for the live launch parties every Sunday night, 7 p.m. Jump into the chat conversation. And we're back on PPN, the Public Place Network. They took a little hiatus this summer. You may notice some enhancements. So we're great to be plugged in with them, and they are fabulous to help us launch this further and further and further. So we are going to get into a wonderful conversation, and I'm going to ask you, when you think of certain words, what reactions do you have? Like when I say these three words, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I just stop there, what's your first reaction? Most people are thrilled that this is finally being exposed, talked about, and things are changing in the workplace and in the world. Other people honestly freak out. They don't know what to do with those three words. Or maybe they just don't understand the importance of those three words. So today, we're going to have a great show. We're going to dive deep into diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we may just have a few laughs along the way as we go deeper and deeper in this today. My guest today has been stringing up difficult conversations for over two decades, performing stand-up in New York nightclubs. Yeah, stand-up comedy. She's earned the rare CSP designation in the public world, uh, in the public speaking sector and working with teams to take the abstract and make it actionable. My guests will share some valuable insights tonight into how to create lasting change, not by waiting for some perfect opportunity, person, or process, but by recognizing that we are all good enough. Please welcome from Eureka, California, speaker, educator, and the would-be vegan, if it weren't for the chocolate peanut butter and milkshakes. Please welcome the Rock the Stage show tonight, Jessica Pettit. There you are. Hello. (laughs) Thank you for having me. First of all, I never knew there was really Eureka. Until I actually watched the show Eureka, and I found out, I Googled, it really is a real city. Yeah, the television show is not based here, uh, but... But, uh, you know, it's a, a fun word. But I live on a cliff on the ocean and the very, 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 very northern part of California. Wow. I'm, I'm, I'm sure the views are beautiful. Stunning. Yes. Redwoods, so, mountains, cliffs. Yeah, it's pretty unbelievable. So you, I, I said you're a speaker, educator. Which one do you prefer? Because I know your topics are highly educational. But you're a fantastic speaker, of course, and you also are a human, a uh, humorist. Which label do you like the best for you? I am a human speaker, educator, and humorist. <laughs> uh, I think my uh, roots are in education, and so I kind of, um, I think that's my comfort zone is uh, academia. I left academia after being fired a million times. And started my own business, but I also come from a family of deep, uh, deep sense of humor and really good storytellers. So it's kind of a Venn diagram for me. Well, you did do stand up comedy. What was that like? Because uh, some people aspire to do it and they can get up on stage, they freeze up, they don't want to do it, or they don't know the punchlines of their own jokes. How was that for you doing comedy clubs? I think that the hardest thing for people to realize is that it's a craft. It's not just funny people, right? So even as a keynoter now for 20 years, uh, it's very intimidating to me to just go to an open mic night now. It's a very different use of the audience or it's both involve an audience and a microphone, but it's a very different space. Um, So in stand up, you are creating a set that looks like you're just talking, but it's actually really well rehearsed and practiced and planned with a couple of little sprinkles of new information. Keynoting is very similar. It's just longer form. And 
you blended those two worlds very well. Because again, <laughs> I hope so. Thank people, you. But you drop <laughs> jokes all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I find, especially in my keynote work, I typically talk about very hard subjects that really freak people out. And so laughing is a great equalizer. So then regardless of people's politics or comfort level in the audience, if I can get people laughing, then we can go deeper and deeper and deeper into the conversations that people are terrified to have. Ultimately, I believe the combination is that if we can talk about current events and politics and things that are easy to label as kind of forgiven topics, which yeah. in a, a stand-up setting is expected, in a keynote setting it's not. But if we can do that, then you can have a conversation with your kid that you've been avoiding or your coworker that you've been avoiding. Those are the real conversations that matter. So, Well, and you do poke at those tough conversations. So like my <laughs> opening said a little bit today, diversity, equity, inclusion. There's a wide range of responses just with those three words. Yeah. So what do you get when you dive into that and you drop humor into that? Because some people are really sensitive. Some people mm -hmm. don't give a flying rip. So what do you do when you start putting humor into that conversation? Well, I think, again, humor is kind of the middle ground, right? Mm -hmm. So if we kind of take the extreme responses, uh, I am often confronted that these are real, real pain and suffering. You shouldn't be joking about it. Right. I'm very aware of that. Thank you. But also notice how you're still in the room because the humor worked, right? The other one is people who feel very disinvited into the conversation because they feel that they've been finger pointed as the problem. And so they don't, they're like, I can come in here. She's not going to make, she's using humor, but she's not making fun of me. Right. So then it's an invitation as much as it is something that gets confronting. Um, and as a pinko commie liberal myself, I think the the folks like me on my team who feel very confronted aren't realizing that they are also part of the problem because they're disinviting people by being so rigid. Um, well and it does remind me of the classic TV show, MASH. MASH mm -hmm. tackled heavy topics. If you paid Very attention heavy to it. topics. And then Hawkeye would crack a joke and break the ice, and then he'd hit you at the end of the show with another really deep moment, and it ripped you apart. One minute you're laughing, one moment you're going, now you're making me think, Hawkeye. Is right. that kind I of mean, your approach a little bit? Right. I mean, for, for those that aren't familiar with MASH, I think it's an excellent example. And like, I take that as a huge compliment that that's what you thought of. Yeah. You have a comedy sitcom that is based in a makeshift hospital during Vietnam. Yeah. Hysterical, right? Like that is not a setting that people would expect humor, but humor is humanity. And so I think that it, I think that it's the key glue to regardless of where we're at, if we can hold a space for where we're all at, humor is what holds that space together. So that's why I dive in. That's perfect. Boom. It's got to be liberating for so many people to finally have, there's a voice, there's a person that's finally saying out loud what I'm thinking in my head. Right. Well, and it's liberating for me. Because it's not sad, depressing, oppression work. It's uplifting, positive, powerful work that doesn't cost anything that we could do. And when I talk about good enough now, I'm saying that we could do this work occasionally some of the time because it'd be better than nothing never. By the way, that's the name of her book, Good Enough Now. Mm -hmm. And you have another book coming out in October. Yes. That one's and called... Yeah, take it away. Take it away. Yeah, so good enough now. Uh, it's really the kind of individual work to do the best you can with what you've got some of the time. And then uh, the last couple of years, I've been working on the new book, which is called Almost Doing Good. And instead of it being about individual responsibility, it's kind of the Star Wars version of the prequel. <laughs> and Almost Doing Good is about organizational responsibility so if we're going to give human rights to organizations, then those organizations need to do this kind of work themselves. So almost doing good. It's coming out in October. Fingers crossed. Wonderful. And again, stick around. At the end of the show, we're going to be 
taking you to her website. So you can order, check all the amazing things out, and learn more about it. But now let's get into the big words. Let's get into the, some people just don't even want to say the word dot dot out loud, but that inclusion, the equity, break down what your version of those three words mean to you personally. Because some, everyone's got their own definition. I'm curious, what, how do you break down the three magic words? Yeah. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do is kind of back up one step. Yeah. In, in the 1900s, when I was in college, this was called like multiculturalism, yes. right? So that we have spent a lot of time coming up with new words for things so that we don't actually have to address what those words are talking about. So whatever word you are comfortable with, great. Please get on the boat. That's all we're asking, right? Like you can call it anything you want to. Can we just get on the boat? So currently today, maybe to yesterday, because I haven't checked all of the social media platforms this morning, maybe there are new words that we have created. Instead of creating new words, I say we just get to work. But new words are created to represent difficulties that are happening, right? So before you hit record, we're talking about failures of these kind of initiatives. So yes. if we're really looking at the failures, there's different facets that lead to those failures. So by using the word diversity, equity, inclusion, if we want to get advanced, we would also throw in the word belonging. And then sometimes justice is now used. Sometimes you hear Jedi, justice, equity, and uh, diversity and inclusion that now we're back to Star Wars, so my comfort zone. <laughs> so those are the words being thrown around right now, right? So the idea of diversity is that basically other people think things, experience things similar and different than you. Mm -hmm. That is it. For some people, that is already a lot of work. Okay, great. Do your work. That sounds amazing. When uh, there, there's an, an amazing assessment tool that I often use with clients and it's, it has a kind of gradation of skill building. And in theory, there's not a judgment. So the, the, what is lower on the skills still has really good, strong pieces, right? So kind of at that lower stage is really where traditions are formed. You understand your own kind of cultural norms. I think of, um, like family traditions, if you yeah. went back to your parents' house, like you know what chair you're sitting in, the special knife is carving the bird, whatever. Yeah. That is some really important cultural foundations, right? There's some positives that come out of it. Eventually you realize not everybody does it your way. So then all of a sudden there are two teams and some people are really threatened by the two teams. Wait till you find out there's like 6 million teams, ah, right? So when you are building the skills to recognize that there are different ways of doing things, you're going to like some of them and you're not going to like some of them. But that's a skill building too, is you're learning what you like and what you don't like. Yep. What are you familiar with? What are you not familiar with? Okay, amazing. Great. Good job. Sometimes you learn new stuff and you don't like your stuff. Sometimes yeah. you learn new stuff and you really double down on your way. Okay, great. Good to know. You add some more skills. Eventually we get to this place and frankly, like over almost 70% of the population lives in this middle zone, okay. um, which basically minimizes those differences because we can't, we all just get along. So great example of this is all lives matter. Yeah. Let's pretend that all lives do matter because we don't actually value all living things equally, but let's just pretend we do. Okay. Okay. And then there's one particular kind of life that Black Lives Matter is calling attention to. Mm -hmm. So it shouldn't be in competition, right? So this minimization stage, which is when we are trying to be harmonious with each other. Yep. Why would we divide out all these differences? Why can't we all just get along? Why we all bleed red, right? Like that kind of stuff. You've built the skills to recognize the differences and now you're finding your commonalities. Well, that's great. That's great. Much better than what we often have on that example. That's exactly a great example of how yeah. we should be able to wrap around. But you're right. But when it gets pulled out separate of the all lives, it just seems like there is a competition. It seems like they're trying to raise a value versus going back to 
we all believe in the same stuff here. Why right. does it matter? Well, and then that's the that's the additional skill building, right? Is that like I'm I'm hearing something that someone else is experiencing that I don't experience. Yeah. Can I hold that as valid even though I don't experience it? That's a different level of skill building. Yes. So when we're talking about diversity and understanding there's different ways of doing things, when we get to equity, what we're realizing is, is that not everyone needs exactly the same things, but the way that they need or want certain things can be accommodated for often. Sometimes it can't, sometimes we don't have the right resources, but if we can accommodate in an equitable fashion, then those little differences don't have to be minimized they can exist without being threatening, right? Yeah. Then, then you can get to a place where all these differences can swirl around me and they don't impact my own belief system, right? I am able to, I am, I yeah. am able to sit in my own place nice. and recognize that all this other stuff is happening. It does not impact my place. And that's where inclusion comes in, is that the idea that all of these things can coexist together, spoiler alert, they're already coexisting. We're, <laughs> it's already happening, right? But we like to think of it as a goal, that we can get to the place where we can admit we're coexisting. That's it. That's diversity, equity, and inclusion in a nutshell. So now that you broke that part of it down, let's go to what I did tease up, and you mentioned a few minutes ago was, why do these diversity initiatives fail? I mean, they put videos out, they have speaking campaigns, they have special activities at universities and businesses now. But is it because they're just checking out the list and we've done it, move on? Is it that you don't have any skin in the game? Why do so many of these go and disappear? Sure. So the answer is yes, all of those things, right? So uh, if we take that kind of scale that I just identified, yeah. if you come up with a program that's for one type of person on one place on that scale, it's going to be really effective for them. But what about everybody else? Your inclusion program is not including everyone. Your inclusion program is only including the people that you are targeting with that particular programming. So surprise, it's not going to work certainly not long-term because you're not including everyone. That's why inclusion matters, right? When we start, how we use the term diversity, equity, and inclusion, ironically, is not usually involved in the DEI initiative. So the new book breaks this down into three very simple parts. Okay. So the, the three parts are preparing, recognizing, and responding. That is it. Most of my clients are in respond mode because something's happened and they got to do something. But how do you respond if you don't actually recognize a problem and you don't actually know what resources or experiences you actually have, right? So let's take, for example, when George Floyd was murdered, yeah. a lot of organizations put out statements mm -hmm. about George Floyd. How hypocritical do you look that you slap together a sentence on your website, but you don't do anything around DEI successfully inside your organization, but you buckle the peer pressure to put a statement up. There's evidence of this because what ended up happening was organizations wrote an apology statement. They don't even know what they're apologizing for, right. but they, they felt that they needed to have it. So then there were the organizations that didn't have a statement. So then they came up with a statement about why they don't have a statement. We're working on a statement. We're not, we don't have a statement, but we are aware there is a need for a statement. You're focusing the statement, the performance of having a statement instead of what the statement is talking about, right? Yeah. So you're, you're in response mode. You did something. Well, what do you want me to do now? I don't know. Mean it, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, when COVID first happened and people started working from home, yeah. disability advocates have been fighting for the ability to work for home for decades. Yes. Right? Yeah. COVID happens, 24 hours, everybody's working from home. And the diversity advocates are like, what a great idea, right? <laughs> 
So it looks disingenuous because they weren't actually prepared to realize work like this has already been happening. We didn't need a global pandemic right. because work like this has actually been happening. Um, so people weren't prepared. They didn't understand what resources they actually had. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of my clients spent thousands of dollars on equipment because they thought they needed to buy it. Right. 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 It took a while, but then people who were working remotely, many of which were working remotely prior to COVID, mm -hmm. same thing with homeschooling. Yeah. Millions of kids are homeschooled prior to this, but now everybody was. So now it feels like some new response. <laughs> so you're not prepared. Yeah. And you're responding in an ill prepared way. Now, the flip of that is that a lot of organizations spend a lot of time preparing. Yes focus groups, surveys, consultant after consultant after consultant after consultant. It's just navel gazing. Then they fail to launch. They, they, they fail to do nothing. anything. <laughs> they're not doing nothing. And the reason why they're not doing nothing is that middle step, which is they're not really recognizing what they're preparing for. Because they think it, it's coming or they think it's something that happened 10 years ago. So to be able to recognize that right now, in your existence, these things are happening. Now, how can you, how are you already prepared to deal with them? You just didn't realize it. And then how are you knee jerk responding so that you can do it in a more informed way? I posit in the new book that if an organization can just consciously do all three at the same time, mm -hmm. it'll work. And what is uh, the big question mark is no one is doing that. So I don't know that I'm right. Well, at least you put it out there. At least we can start wrestling with it. And right. have it, it wrong. To go that back. would be right. Yes. Yeah. I, I make a joke in the book. The third book is called Better, Doing Good Better. <laughs> and everybody who wants to prove me wrong, go ahead. I will gather those stories and I will use you as an example of how you are doing good better. Because well, right I now, I don't think anybody's doing it better. <laughs> well, and you've, you've got a model that fits all of that. Do mm -hmm. the best you can with what you got. Yep. And to me, it boils it down very simply. Start with what you got. You don't have to scramble and do all this other big stuff. Mm -hmm. You've already got something there somehow. Start yep. with what you got. And I think it's very simple. But I think people don't understand how simple it can be, correct? Right. Like, uh, my, <laughs> this is a funny example, but my therapist said that, uh, being naked is very easy, right? Yeah. Like <laughs> we could do this so easily, but it is so scary and so vulnerable and so new and so complicated what goes into actually doing something very easy that that's the parallel. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, and I and I know one of the other points you talk about is making the connection helps get through a lot of this bumpy road, awkward road. The connectivity mm -hmm. is huge part of this, but some people don't know how to make a connection anymore. Right. And they don't even realize that they are unconsciously breaking down the connections. So I walk people through this process of being able to pay attention. When do you opt out? And that seems like a pretty easy question, but people don't pay attention to their own conversations mm -hmm. to notice when they opt out. Like, so I, in my keynotes, I always ask first question, how many of you have had a hard conversation? Every hand goes up. Yep. How many of you have had a hard conversation that went a wall? You have no idea where it's going, but you care about the topic or the person, so you're going to hang in there. Yep. Almost every hand stays up. Great. Why do we choose not to do that sometimes then? And it's because we don't know how to win. We don't know how to make them lose. We don't know how to be right, or we don't know how to make them wrong. Yep. And it's the person or the topic we're uncomfortable with. That's so, not threatening. That's just recognizing that you're part of the problem. So that's a, so I've, I've got a philosophy, my business talks that I've done when I work with the executive leaders. I mean, everyone's got their mission statement, their vision statement, but they don't have a value list. So they all have a 
value list that the company can wrap around. And we agree to these things. Mm -hmm. I go back to the fact if, if you have a value system that you and I both agree on, when it comes to those delicate conversations, we bring back up the value system to help us get through the rough water because we value the same things. So we'll do respect. We'll do listening better. We'll do, I'm going to go the extra mile and check things out for you. If those are your values, when you get these sticky situations, it helps everyone reset and get back on point to get through right. it, the conversation. Why don't we talk about that when it comes to this conversation? Because we don't even talk about it on an individual level. You know, that as different as my brother and I are, one of the things that we have definitely realized is our parents instilled in us a good work ethic and a strong sense of humor, right? Yep. We are wildly different people, <laughs> but we both have a very strong work ethic and we are very funny, right? So no matter how different we are politically, religiously, how we raise our families, what choices, where we choose to live, yeah. those two things are like a common thing that came out of the Pettit upbringing, right? Mm -hmm. But most people don't understand what they actually value. And if they're asked, they crowdsource it to other people. What do you think I value? And then... Organizations do the same thing. I'll talk to founders of an organization and they don't know why they founded their organization other than to make money. Yes. Great. Okay. So make money and what, what are you solving? What do you care about? What's the values of this organization? If we can't do it individually and we can't do it organizationally, that's a great place to start. <laughs> and I've done that in workshops and it's amazing. CEO, the executive team, and I, I simply ask, what's the value system? Can you name five values for your company and what you do and why you do it? And then I collect all the little pieces of the paper, I get a whiteboard and I start writing now. Very few companies, very few, can their top tier leaders even cite the same common five values? Yeah. Or I find they are lying to themselves. Yes, but, yes. But the client that actually led to me writing this book because I was so infuriated, I tell the story in the book, but one of the, um, one of the corporate values is bring your whole self to work. Yeah. But after interviewing a hundred some odd employees around the world in 11 different countries, bring your whole self to work meant different things to different people in different countries and different jobs in different places in, in the hierarchy of the organization. So it turns out bring your whole self to work meant white, liberal, progressive, secular people. So they're very like trans inclusive, gay inclusive, mm -hmm. um, straight white people. You were also included liberal very progressive sustainability, you know, they win all these awards is this amazing place to work. But if you're conservative, you did not feel welcome at work. If you weren't, uh, if you were religious of any kind, you yep. didn't feel welcome at work. And if it weren't, wasn't Christian, it definitely wasn't welcome at work. And if you're a person of color, you didn't feel welcome at work. So the same organization is winning wild amounts of global awards because it's so inclusive to liberal secular people. So then me, this liberal queer person had to be like, hello, do you know that you have evangelical Christians that work here? And they think you're shoving gay stuff down their throats. So bring your whole self to work doesn't mean them. Yes. And I had the CEO told me, well, they shouldn't work here. And I'm like, too late. They already do. <laughs> so, like, you're are you going to fire people? Because I'm going to go with, no, you're not. Right? right? Like, so don't, your quippy little values that you really, really believe in yeah. may not actually mean what you think they mean. And they may not be enforced the way you think they are. And largely, it is a value you have that you assume everybody else has. And now we're getting into like founder syndrome, right? When it yes. was four of you in a garage, yes, that made sense. Well, now you have 180,000 employees in 11 different countries. Do you think the culture has changed at all? 
from a card table in Jeff's garage to this global empire? Do you do you think anything might need to be reviewed? That's wonderful. I mean, that that's it. And again, it's hard for some people to roll back, to go back, to fix, to go forward. Mm -hmm. But if you don't roll back, identify the landmines that you've created, you're never going to get into the conversations that you're in. And it's well, funny. I, I would even challenge, because going backwards is scary to people. Yes. Right. And so I think one of the most powerful reasons I was compelled to write this second book is that most of my clients are terrified to be first, but they are very confident that they are not last. <laughs> well, don't tell me you're leading then. Yeah. Be a leader, yeah. right? Like encourage your communities and your industries to do better. I don't, you don't have to go backwards. I mean, reconciliation and taking responsibility for harm you've caused would be amazing, yeah. but let's just call that the cherry on top. Why don't you just say whoopsie and move forward differently? Fall that would be sword, amazing. Fall on the sword, admit it, and then move forward. Get back up. Right. So um, can I use a controversial example? Yeah, uh, please. No, that's this? what we're here for. Go for it. Okay. Trigger warning. I'm getting ready to talk about something controversial. Okay. <laughs> Part of the reason I believe that the United States has a very hard time figuring out how it's going to talk about Gaza, Palestine, and Israel is because it can't vocalize why it's actually supporting what it's actually supporting. Because if it does this, it looks anti-Semitic and nobody wants to do that, right. except for anti-Semites. If it does this, it looks racist. And in reality, what we are doing is we are making amends for guilt of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. The Holocaust, the idea of the Holocaust came from Indian law and Jim Crow laws in the United States. That's where Adolf Hitler was like, oh my God, if you make someone's existence political, you can create an us and them and I can get power, right? Yeah. Indian yeah. law and Jim Crow law taught him this and we have never, ever, ever claimed responsibility for slavery and Indian law that is still in place because it was a failed attempt at genocide here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then at the end of World War II, the idea came up of we're going to create a Jewish state. Well, that's amazing. Where are we going to put that? Germany was like, I'm not giving up any land. The United <laughs> States was like, I'm not giving up any land. So then conveniently, this place where people already lived, but a failed attempt at genocide never hurt nobody except for the people who are actually being bombed to death. Mm -hmm. We're going to give up somebody else's land that is also conveniently in a very helpful military spot. <laughs> it is also religiously and culturally relevant. Mm -hmm. Or that's what we're going to do. It's complicated because we've made it complicated because we as a country have not taken responsibility for our role in successful and failed attempts at genocide. And that's, I mean, just the idea of taking responsibility. Again, when you say that you're going to be talking about diversity, inclusion, and again, some people have added even more words on all this, but when you, when you get into that, you have to admit, first of all, I'm going to own my own crap. Mm -hmm. Admit it to you, ask for forgiveness, or at least acknowledge and say, and say, I'm doing away with that. We're moving forward in a new direction. Let's connect and communicate so we can move in a new direction. Right. Right. Now, I know that what I just said is probably very upsetting to people. And so don't come for you. The Rock the Stage had me as a guest. So you are welcome to blow up my email and talk to me about what I'm wrong. Historically speaking, mm -hmm more pain and suffering continues when the people who caused the pain and suffering didn't take responsibility for it in the first place. Yes. Exactly. It would be lovely if we all went backwards and took responsibility, but I don't think we can. And I think honestly, we use that as an excuse because we can't do it. Yeah. Instead of today, I'm going to take responsibility for this. And then I'm going to move forward knowing I'm responsible for that pain and suffering. Exactly. Exactly. 
anyway, don't blow up, don't blow up his. <laughs> I appreciate that, but yeah, you know, <laughs> I got big shoulders. I can handle it. Um, so let's go back into your speaking world for a second. You also love public speaking so much with the National Speakers Association that we both have a kindred spirit with, have been a part of. Uh, you actually support and help the National Speakers Association Foundation Charitable Fund. And for those that do not know, NSA, the National Speakers Association, is a, a group, global group, that is all public speakers from different sectors and areas that come together and we support, we grow, we advance our skills, but we have a blast at a couple of big events as well. But they now have created a charitable foundation Mm -hmm. If you're sick, if you're in need, if something catastrophic happens to you and you're one of the national speakers, they have a process, you sign up, and they will financially help you, support you, get you resources, whatever. It's an amazing charity for speakers who are usually independent operators working for themselves very often. That charity is amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, a lot of corporations have an employee-funded foundation. Uh, Walmart's the first one I can think of. Um, I only know this because of a recent study I read that over 80% of Walmart employees donate to the employee fund. And that's to help employees who have illnesses or car accidents or are impacted by hurricanes or tornadoes who need emergency funds. And it's funded by employees. So the National Speakers Association has a similar foundation charity fund and uh, the members typically are the ones who donate money or raise money for the foundation. And then members who are impacted by natural disaster, um, personal illness, uh, health-related issues that impacts their ability to work can apply for a grant that it does not have to be repaid. Yep. And then that grant is, uh, the application is approved by a very undercover, not known committee. Right. Yep. Um, because you don't need to be soliciting people. And when people have emergencies, it's a really vulnerable thing to ask for assistance. Um, and then the uh, amount is given uh, to the person to help them get through a hard time. It's a wonderful foundation. I've personally benefited from it. And I have supported it every year that I've been a member of NSA, which is 23 years now. Yeah, and I've gotten to know some of the spokesmen for it that, oh, that, that do go out and say, here's what it is. Don't forget about it. I love we take care of our own in the NSA. Mm -hmm. We do. It's, and again, we talked about connection early on. NSA has that value of we're going to connect um, and be a part of it. So that's a super charity. Thank for allowing us to talk about it for a few minutes here because people are not aware. They just think of speakers get on stage. We all do our own thing. We all walk off separately. We're actually more connected than people realize. We, we referenced your website earlier. I want to make sure we take a moment here and you hit the QR code, you're going to go right to the website, but Jess, what are they going to find when they go to your website? So uh, the website should take you to good enough now. And there's, you know, information about my MC skills or services, uh, my um, keynoting, virtual webinars, things like that. Um, if you go to almostdoinggood.com, um, which I didn't tell Richard about in advance, uh, but that is where you can pre-order the book. Um, almost doing good before October. Um, otherwise, it's available wherever you would buy ebooks, audiobooks, or paperbacks. There you go. Hit the QR code. You want to make sure you grab it, go visit, explore it. It's got wonderful stuff. And again, if you're even a speaker, go check out a fellow speaker's website and uh, you know see what they got going on over there. Yeah. Jessica, we're running down to the end of our time here today, but I want to go back around. Diversity, equity, inclusion. What's the biggest thing you want people to know about when it comes to this area? Because again, you work in the business sector, but you bring the humor into it. What's the best thing that you could land the plane and give us something here today? If I'm landing the plane, failures are steps in the right direction. And if you use your failures back in 1984, you did something and it didn't work and it blew up in your face. Great. Do something different or do it again because it's not 1984. Try something different. Go back. Do it again. I love that. Try, try, try. Yeah. Jessica Pettit, thank you for being with us here today on Rock the Stage Show. We are grateful to have you here. And again, best of luck for the new book. Again, go to the website. Watch for that book. 
learn when it's coming out in October. You're going to want to get it, read it, probably highlight it and have a lot of fun with it. Jessica, thanks for being with us. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Richard. And thank you for all the listeners. Remember, don't blow up his box. You can email me, jess at goodenoughnow.com. Happy to connect. Perfect. And again, th- we have a wide range of topics. We have a wide range of people that pop in on Rock to Stage Show, but they're all rock stars in their own way. Uh, and again, comedy, stand up, public speaking, author. She checks a lot of boxes, but this particular topic, is very important to dive deeper in. So hopefully tonight you've gotten a better insight, a greater understanding, or maybe it's going to make you rethink and go deeper yourself and learn more about what diversity, equity, and inclusion means to you, doesn't mean to you, or how do you help the conversation grow further and further. And that's going to do it for me, the Trigger Rich Bond Trigger on Sunday night. We'll be back here again every Sunday night, 7 p.m. Eastern time. We go live with Rock the Stage Show. Again, we travel the world. And we bring some of the best influencers, leaders, media experts, you name it. We're we're bringing them in. Sunday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Join us for that live chat party. You can join the conversation with a live streaming audience as they watch it. Or also check us out on PPN, the Public Place Network, where we are now in 17 different countries worldwide. Hey, until next week, I'm Rich Bontrager, The Trigger. We'll see you next time here on Rock to Stage.